I played well over 40 hours of the Crash Team Rumble beta, and I do have some critiques that I think would vastly improve the game, whether they would be at launch or perhaps at a later date. Let's talk about it. What's up guys, Canadian Gaia here, and I am back with a bit of a lengthy video. So before I even dig in, I want to say I absolutely adored this game. I played the beta all the way until I was literally disconnected from the servers. Toys for Bob had to literally drag me out of the servers kicking and screaming. So just know that when you see this video and be like, oh, did CGE not like Crash Team Rumble? No, no, I loved it. Just because this video is long doesn't mean I thought the game was bad. It's just that there is a lot that I want to talk about. Like, you know, everything. So buckle in and hang tight. We have a lot to go over. First and foremost, let's start with the heroes. Overall, the heroes in Crash Team Rumble feel very well tuned actually, each one bringing something new to the table. The most balanced heroes being our two marsupials, Crash and Coco. Honestly, while I played both of these characters quite a bit, they felt like that they were actually pretty well tuned and balanced. While having very similar kits, Crash has a more aggressive playstyle and Coco is more of a defensive supporting role. They both have a triple spin, a slam, and have a mobile air dash. Where they change is that Crash has a slide that allows him to maintain quite a bit of his momentum, along with knocking people back. And Coco has her quantum wall that allows her to jump off of and jump a far distance through the air, along with bouncing any enemies that encounter it, and boosts any allies that run through it. It's a really good tool for utility. Honestly, not many changes if any, would be needed for these two. The only thing that I can think of, if I'm being a little nitpicky, is maybe have enemies unpop out of their squish mode just a little bit sooner after Crash and Coco hit them with their slam, just so that they can't chain so many slams together as easily. But beyond that, that is just a nitpick. And maybe with Coco, maybe making her Quantum Walls hitbox match a little bit better because it seems like it's a little bit bigger than its actual visual. Other than that, these two are pretty much just well balanced as are. If they launched like this, I'd be happy. Cortex is going to be my next target. And I want to forewarn you, while I did get him to level 6, I played him the least and had the least knowledge of this character, especially in comparison to other people. I had a really hard time getting the hang of the character, but I did watch other people just absolutely wreck as him. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, the character's bad. No, no, no. I'll just tell you my two issues that I felt. I felt the target system while Cortex held square was a little wonky. I wish there was a way to almost lock on to one person and keep shooting instead of the reticle just kind of bouncing around from target to target. I also had a hard time with holding square and pressing R2 to turn people into animals. I just kept dropping pianos on people and I just could not get it right. As someone who is uneducated on Cortex, I felt like holding square to charge it up and fire would be what turns people into animals and to just tap square to use his blaster. But that's coming from someone who struggled with Cortex. So take that with a grain of salt. And finally, we have two characters that I have a lot of experience with, and I do think that they need a little bit of tuning. Let's start with my very first level six mastered character, Tana. Tana is an absolute blast to play. She is mobile, fast and has some sweet moves. Her grapple hook being able to stun characters along with having an agile uppercut and overhead smash lets her make plays that are quite spicy. Though she is my first mastered character, she does have a few issues. The problem with Tana is that she is a glass cannon with very thin hitboxes. Being a glass cannon is completely fine, it's an absolute great strategy. How Ever, her windows of opportunity to make plays are very, very small because of those short hitboxes, and there's less benefit to play her in comparison to Coco or Crash. There are times where her hookshot sometimes feels like it should hit a hero, but it doesn't. I think that making her hookshot hitbox a bit wider would help land more during those really clutch moments. The same goes for her uppercut, as this is her only tool to get people physically off of key objectives. It should have a little bit more leeway in terms of a hitbox, so that you can actually knock more people off and not be as quite direct. 
Dingo Dial is my big, thick lad, and I love the bugger. He's slow, tanky, strong, everything that I love in a character. While I did master Tana first, Dingo Dial is the character that I played the most. Mostly because, well, no one wanted to be a blocker. <laughs> Dingo Dial does seem overwhelmingly strong to early players, as you can just sit on your bank and harass everyone off of it. While Dingo Dial is a menace, especially in early level lobbies, players can start to quickly figure out how to fight him as they get better and better at the game. Now, I have two issues specifically with Dingo Dial. Dingo has a very powerful Super Tail Whip ability where you can hold square for a short period of time before releasing, and it releases this super awesome tailspin. But sometimes, if you're chaining quick tail attacks together into a super tail spin, you can actually eat your input for the charged up attack. Thus, it will not start the wind up, and when you release square, you don't do the super tail spin. It makes for uh, <clears throat> some awkward moments. The other issue is Dingo Dial's circle circle combo. More specifically, the first circle. It's weird. Like, it doesn't visually make sense. There are times where I felt like I landed the first circle and came to follow up with the second, only to find out that I actually didn't land the first circle and the enemy just kind of awkwardly runs away or just fights me and squishes me to death. The only time that I used it was if the vac gun was literally jammed right up into their faces like a shotgun, just so that I knew they were in range. I didn't know if the visuals need to be adjusted, if the ability needs work, or if the particle and VFX need to be changed, but there is a definite clarity issue. I'm not sure how to exactly fix this, but there needs to be an adjustment here. Now, let's get to the powers. Let's start with the power that needs work, but not for the reason that you might think. That power up is the Spitting Fly Trap. Now, if you think I'm gonna come here and say that the trap needs to do more damage, I'm gonna say no. Oh, then maybe it needs more health. Again, no. See, one trick with the trap is that you can hold a numerous amount of them, and they are also considered as players. So when you plant them on Wumpa Gem Pads, they will lock down the pads for you. Also, if you drop a spitter down on a pad and an enemy lands on it while you're trying to take control of the other pads, the fly spitter denies the enemy player from being able to change the color of the gem pad to their teams. So if you have a bunch of fly spitters stored, you can drop them on multiple gem pads in rapid succession and take over the entire batch solo, which is awesome. However, beyond that trick, they are not used very often, so I thought that maybe if the Fly Spitter's projectile actually left behind an ooze that would slow enemies down and deal a little bit of damage over time while standing or running through it. Now, it would only stay for a couple of seconds, or just one second, but it would add more functionality to the power, making it still very useful for gem pads, but also against quick characters who are hard to pin down, and if you have multiple of them spinning, at the same time, it could really create a really fun chain reaction for having multiple spitters going at once. The healing fridge is an interesting one. On paper, it leads little to no fixing. It can block some objectives from being dropped, refresh the team, and be destroyed with relative ease. If it needed any changes, maybe slow the healing down a little bit, but overall, it's basically fine. The problem is when you have two fridges. It just becomes no fun for anyone. A change that could be done is either keep the double fridge strat, but the fridge's healing is reduced if you recently get hit by an enemy, or make it so that two fridges can't heal the same hero at once. There's a couple of ways to fix this, but the singular fridge itself is perfectly fine. The Wumpa Stash is also pretty much good to go. My only comment is maybe have a bit more interaction if you add another Wumpa Stash on top of the one you currently have. As of now, if you activate it while holding another Wumpa Stash, it adds 20 Wumpa to your entire stash. Maybe reset the timer and make it double or nothing? Just a thought to play with. Now, we get to Greg. Who's Greg? The Gas Moxian Guard, of course. Everyone's favorite power. He's named Greg because I'm not going to say Gas Moxian Guard over and over and over again through the video. So from here on out, his name is Greg. 
don't question it. Greg is one of, if not the most popular power, and for good reason. One Greg on a bank and your turn-ins are basically null and void. He also holds down a lot of objectives very, very well, especially stuff like the bonus bank, and it's just a nightmare to anyone who's not on his team. In order to defeat him, you kind of need to rally the team together and smack him to death. Now, while I love Greg and he has won me many, many matches, I think he's a little too beefy or stays a little too long. Even with a Cortex, it can take a while to melt down a Greg. So an adjustment on either how long he stays around for or how beefy he is might be in order. Now in this video, I don't want to talk too much about what they could add to the game. Just what was present in the beta, but there is something that I think could be added that could also fix with the previous issues that I had, like the multiple fridges and Greg, and that is some kind of a counter power. Imagine activating just a little turret that would follow you around that would be focused on shooting other power summons and maybe some boxes to collect you some Wumpa. It wouldn't deal damage to players as its main goal is to counter other powers, but that's just an idea. Next up, we have the levels. Just Beachy is a really fun map. It's small, but it's a lot of fun. My only concern is actually the relic stations. As you know, there are only two relics on Just Beachy, the Beach Balls and the Epic Relic Station, the Bonus Bank. But there might be a couple problems here. Most other levels have multiple kinds of basic relic stations, but Just Beachy only has one. Now, to the second problem. The only way to break the Beach Balls is to slam them from up high. Unfortunately, not every character even has access to a slam, like Dingo Dial and Tana. So maybe a two birds, one stone situation could be a defensive relic at the banks that also has the potential to pop any beach balls that land on it, like a spike trap, or heck, let's follow the theme and make it a puffer fish. Also, beach balls float. So maybe if you're in your beach ball and you land in the water, you can actually float for a couple of seconds. Unless the ball pops, then, well, it's Bye Bye Bandicoot. Tiki Towers is really the stage that's kind of seen as the model level to show off to everyone. It has the crash look, aesthetic, has great power-ups, and it's an overall fun stage. But there's really one thing that bothers me about the level, and that's the Bandicoot Pult. The only use it really has to get to on top of the tower as fast as possible to fight for the center gem pads. There is also relics at the top of the tower, however it costs two relics and then you get three at the top. So you're kind of only netting one. So beyond that, it's kind of it. With every other relic station on the map being super important, like Uka Uka and even the cannon barrages, I feel like the Bandicoot Pult either needs more pizzazz or be reduced to one relic. If we went the pizzazz route, maybe it grants a movement speed boost upon landing, or a little health boost for quick escapes, or maybe even increase it to three relics, and when someone lands after being launched, it does an AoE damage wave that is also a small knockback to everyone around the person landing. Just something to give it a little bit more use because it can also be used to defend Uka Uka and other places around the Bandicoot Pult itself. But overall, beyond that, this is a fantastic level. Calamity Canyon is the most notorious for the common where's my bank again issue? Every single match, I find myself running to the wrong bank every time. And I literally don't know why. I get so mixed up and confused on where I am and it drives me insane. Maybe it's the spawning spot? I can't make heads or tails of it. Also, Oxide should be able to move a little bit faster. If you're a mobile character like Tana or Coco, Oxide is annoying but manageable, which also leads to my next critique of Oxide. He should switch targets sooner. It's a little annoying when your team drops 30 relics and he spends half the time chasing down one or two people and doesn't even get them. If you have someone that knows what they're doing and they're fast enough to keep clear of them, they just run them around the stage away from their allies. Oxide should be able to shift his target sooner and not chase for so long so that his time isn't wasted chasing someone who's hypermobile. Now, there is a critique that a friend of mine, Wampa Lewis, said over on his channel, which was that the characters aren't really talking and that it would give more life to the game if they actually did. And I would have to agree. Crash Bandicoot is full of such colorful characters that all have their own personalities, so more verbal interactions between the characters would be a lot of fun. But there's another issue that has a solution that can also remedy this one. 
The ping system is not bad, but could use some work. At the moment, you click the ping button and all you hear is a whistle and help. It's nothing specific, it just says help. Now, while this is better than nothing, I think giving an actual verbal cue from the character you're playing as would help with both clarity and personality, along with the ping changing the voice line depending on where it's placed. Let me show you an example for Coco. Need some help on this bank. Get this dingo dial off of our bank. Don't let them turn in. Turn in your relics, we can win. Of course, to make sure it's not spammed over and over again, the voice line would only trigger on the first set of pings, and if you repeatedly ping it, it would just become the whistle sound effect. After a match, getting top performer feels great, and while the banner and victory music is fantastic, I think showing off the hero and their skin would also be fun, while also emoting. This would kind of be a fun way to show off the cosmetics that you own, which also might cause others to say, hey, how did they get that skin? That's so cool, and cause the other players to investigate and engage further with the game to see how they also can get that skin. Now, we get to actually outside of the game, like the menus and the UI. Overall, the UI is good and works just fine. That is until we get into the lobby. There's an obvious and common bug where after you select your power, it displays the power that you selected from the previous match, but when you get into the actual game, it's the power you selected. To fix this real quick, you just gotta back out and go back in and the power is there. The bigger issue, however, is the fact that people don't know that you need to ready up. So everyone just sits as the timer ticks down as one or two people don't know that they can ready up and end that timer sooner, as they just see a green dot and don't really know what it means and there's no ready up button. This can be fixed by simply adjusting the UI, having the hero and power as something as you can select with a third ready up option. This can especially speed up the ready process if you want to dive into the next match with the exact same power and character. However, a warning should also pop up if you are missing people and you're the last person to ready up. As if everyone who readies up and their spots open, the game will autofill those spots with bots. People might want to wait to see if anyone will be added to their lobbies. Actually, funny enough, this leads to my next point, matchmaking. Before the beta, it was said that there would be an MMR system integrated into it so that people would have a similar experience across the board and not deal with people that were playing since day one versus people who just started. This um, didn't quite happen for me. Time after time, you would see some teams be completely stacked like this example here. Now granted, I'm sure Toys for Bob did not expect people to blitz the game like some of us did, so I will admit it is possible that this critique is not accurate to how the system is supposed to work because players who were around level 40 skewed it. So take this critique with a grain of salt. Another issue is that the bots do need work. I know programming bots is difficult. It's not easy to just scream, hey, make them more competent and smarter. But there would be times where bots would simply get stuck on ledges or just run off the cliff for no reason. So I think an improvement needs to be made there. Perhaps there'd be a little reset system to where they reset to their bank if they get stuck. But also, have the bots be role aware. The only bots that we would get were either Crash or Coco, and the problem is that you don't know which one you were going to get. Then the match starts and you find out that you have three scores. That's less than ideal. If you have to deal with bots, the bots should fill the roles that are missing on your team. If there's no blocker, the bot should select a blocker. If there's no score, the bot should pick a score. If it's all balanced, then it can pick at random. And lastly, we have the social tab. I've mentioned this before, and my only issue with it is, um, all of it. It's, <laughs> it's cluttered, it's not really intuitive, it's glitchy, and literally the reason why half of the crashes that I actually had had happened. Weird issues like duplicated names, people not getting their invite, people getting kicked out, the list goes on. One friend of mine actually had to go get another beta code for his PlayStation because he could not join our room with his preferred console, which was Xbox. However, my wife was upstairs on my other Xbox in the same lobby as me, so we don't know what happened there. Also, if I was duoing with someone and I was the lobby leader, if I left the matchmaking because we were about to be autofilled with bots or if I wanted to just 
just go check something out. It would kick my duo out and I would have to reinvite them. It's very strange and might need some fundamental work from the ground up, while also looking a bit more clear and a bit more intuitive. That's literally the only thing that I did not like about this beta was the social tab. If you made it to the end of the video, then I applaud you because this was a long one. Crash Team Rumble is coming out on June 20th, 2023, and I can't wait to see what they have in store. Did you have any critiques? What do you want to see changed? And did you agree or disagree? Comment below and let me know. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video and our live stream. Bye-bye!